Hi, I'm Jacob Appel, and I am a professor of psychiatry and medical education at Mount Sinai, but much of what I do is teach bioethics. And what I came to talk to you about today are COVID ethics and particularly resource allocation in times of crisis, which is what I study. Um, and the two questions I wanna look at today are how should healthcare resources be allocated in non-crisis situations to give us a little bit of a baseline? And then more importantly, how should this calculus change during a widespread emergency like the COVID-19 pandemic? So bioethics is really about asking the right questions. Um, and some of the questions we should have been asking all along, the COVID epidemic has forced us to ask. We should ask ourselves why we haven't asked them earlier. Before I get to the hard questions, I wanna tell you a joke. And I tell you in advance that it's a joke because I'm a bioethicist, not a comedian. If I didn't tell you that, you might not know, but it serves a pedagogical purpose. So two professors retire from Mount Sinai and they go off to Yellowstone National Park. And on their first morning there, they decide to go for a hike. And the ranger comes out and says, I have to warn the two of you. There are bears in the woods and a bear could eat you. And the first Brown professor says, First Sinai professor says, not too much to concern about. And we've dealt with Mount Sinai students, we can handle a bear. Second Mount Sinai professor says, give me a moment, goes back to his cabin, returns a few moments later with his Mount Sinai running shoes and his Mount Sinai jogging shorts and his Mount Sinai cap and he's ready to run. And the first professor says, are you out of your mind? You cannot run a bear. And the second professor says, of course not, but now I can outrun you. And that's the general principle of how bioethics works. We're not gonna get to an ideal answer. We're gonna get to the least worst answer under the scenario. So resources come in three categories. There are hard scarcities, things like solid organs or pediatric neurosurgeons, things that overnight we can't create more of. There are soft scarcities, like the amount of money we spend in healthcare. And in theory, we can generate more revenue, we can raise taxes, we can cut spending in other areas. And then there are evaporating or conservable resources like antibiotics, which means up to a point, we can use them widely with efficacy. And then at some point, pathogens develop resistance and we can't use them anymore if we overuse them. Most of the scarcities in the context of COVID are hard scarcities. They are things like ventilators, ECMO machines, PPE, items that we can't generate in large quantities or in bulk quantities at the speed we need them. So I want you to think back a second to non-crisis times in case someone is watching this in future years, this is year one of the pandemic. And for those of you who don't remember, on the upper right, that is a band at a concert. On the bottom right, that is a restaurant. On the bottom left, that is a sporting event. These are things you will explain to your grandchildren someday. In the world before the pandemic, there were three kinds of allocation. The first kind of allocation is macro allocation at the largest level. This asks the question, how much money do we spend on healthcare as a society versus other elements in society? So as a percentage of our gross domestic product, we spend about 17 to 18% of our money on healthcare. That compares to about 6% on education. If you look at the chart on the bottom right, you can see that we spend a much larger percentage than any other developed nation. Um, what they can't tell you is whether our healthcare system is better or worse for delivery than a national healthcare system like Britain or a single payer system like Canada, because we're comparing apples and oranges, we spend a lot more money. If they spend 18% of their GMP on healthcare in a country like Great Britain, they might not have the lines or waiting lists they do now. We don't know. The key point I wanna make is that the amount of money you allocate in non-crisis times for healthcare affects the amount of money you need to spend during a crisis like COVID. So if you have a healthier population at baseline, they are less at risk, they are less likely to need ventilators, ICU care. And we'll talk about that more in a moment. Um, so a dollar spent now can save you many dollars once a pandemic begins. Related to this is the work of probably our most important healthcare theorist, a man named Lester Thoreau. And Thoreau was a healthcare economist who said the challenge in the United States is that we're both libertarian and egalitarian when it comes to healthcare. We're libertarian in the sense that if there's an intervention out there that anybody can afford, we feel uncomfortable saying they can't afford it. Bill Gates, Warren Buffett can pay for a high-end experimental treatment. We don't stand in their way. But then when other people have the same illness who can't afford that treatment, we as a society feel the need to step in and cover their care. And a rising tide raises all costs. 
The second kind of allocation is meso allocation. That's where we spend our money within the healthcare system. And we could spend it on research, spend it on prevention, we could spend it on acute care. And again, the point I wanna make is the amount of money we spend on research and prevention in non-crisis times will affect the amount of money we need to spend on acute care during crisis times. So the concrete example I always use in terms of how Americans' values are skewed is every year we spend, actually I'll give you a very concrete example. So we all remember the ice bucket challenge to raise money for uh, ALS. In its first year, it raised about $100 million. That seems like a lot of money. That is half the amount of money that Americans spent that same year on Halloween costumes for their pets. That is worth thinking about. That shows you where our priorities are. But if we spent more money on research and development, we would need to spend much less money on the actual allocation of resources to acute care. And third, there's micro-allocation. There's where in the system, which diseases we actually spend our money on. And you can look at this chart, and diseases on the bottom right are those we spend less money on per capita or per life year cost, and those in the upper left are those we spend more money on. And some diseases have shifted significantly. So breast cancer, HIV, when I was younger, used to be heavily underfunded, and now they are slightly overfunded per population. You notice that my field, psychiatry, suicide, is way down on the right, but most strikingly at the very far right, lower bottom, pandemic preparation. This is something that we have not historically spent any money on, even though it's the risk of impacting very large numbers of people, and as we've seen, taking many lives. I also want to mention the particular racial demographic implications of microallocation. They should not be lost on us by briefly comparing two diseases. So cystic fibrosis is a disease that both population-wise and iconically in terms of image is more likely to affect Europeans or European Americans. And sickle cell disease is a disease that both statistically and in terms of public image is associated with African Americans. Even though sickle cell disease affects a far larger number of people, cystic fibrosis receives more money from the MIH, more philosophic independent, philanthropic independent expenditures, um, has a much larger number of annual publications, and more clinical trials receiving funding. So if you want to compare this to the amount of money we spent in ALS, um, or for that matter, the amount of money we spent on Halloween costumes for pets, NIH funding for sickle cell disease only totals about $75 million. That's striking. And it actually matters when we think about COVID and the various populations most impacted by it. I want to mention briefly the Slim Watson case, because he is an outlier, and yet at the same time, a paragon of what is occurring in healthcare. Slim Watson was a North Carolina prison guard. And one day in 1999, he noticed hematomas under his skin and went to his local hospital, the Duke University Medical Center, and was diagnosed with a rare disorder, factor in 7 inhibitor syndrome, that for practical purposes for this audience is similar to hemophilia. And he required a treatment that cost $12,000 an hour. And every hour they gave him another vial of this experimental medication that was flown in from Denmark to the point where Duke was concerned local medical center, which happened to be the Duke University Medical Center, that he might actually bankrupt the hospital system and went to Congress to get special legislation passed just to cover his health care under Medicare. At the end of one month, his hospital bill received by his wife came out to about $300,000. That was not that much money because the Duke University computer system couldn't print the digit to the left. His first month's bill was $5,300,000. And the question you want to ask yourself is for those of you who believe in some form of universal health care, is there a point where we cut people off, where we say, you've exhausted your supply and the $5 million a month you cost could be spent on a very large number of mammograms or flu shots and save many more people? This is becoming an important question in relation to very expensive drugs. So if you look at the world's most expensive drugs in the year 2013, um, these are drugs that if I prescribed, I would probably be fired by the hospital on the spot but they are available for rare conditions. And then Zolgensima came along. Zolgensima is a Novartis drug for SMA that runs $2.1 million per dose. If you ask yourself, should we spend $2.1 million on anyone's healthcare? We're gonna be asking this question a lot more because as a result of the Orphan Drug Act of 1983, which encourages 
research and development for treatments and cures for diseases affecting fewer than 200,000 Americans, such as tax breaks and fast break approval. There's an incentive for drug companies to develop such drugs. Prior to 1983, only 38 such drugs had received FDA approval. Since 2008, 503 have been approved. Zilgensma only costs or only will cost about a billion dollars to treat the estimated number of patients who will benefit. But there are five to 8,000 other orphan genetic conditions. If we were to develop treatments or cures for these diseases, the cost could run into the trillions of dollars. And that seems to become a large factor in the American economy, and that will force us to make determinations how much a life is really worth. I want to mention one more item about pre-COVID healthcare, and then I want to talk a little bit about crisis times. So there has been an effort to allocate resources rationally, at least once effectively in the United States. John Kitzhaber, the former governor of Oregon, who was also an emergency room doc, became concerned that we funded the care for visible victims more than invisible victims. What did he mean by that? He meant if you show up at the hospital with a severe life-threatening illness that is very costly to treat, we spend a lot of money on you. And if we don't, you feel you've been cheated. You feel like we've taken your life by not caring for you. But if you don't get a mammogram or a flu shot because nobody offers that to you, or treatment for your alcoholism, or smoking cessation, or weight loss therapy that prevents your diabetes, you don't think of yourself as a victim in the same way. You're an invisible victim. His goal was to raise the ceiling for Medicaid so that rather than the state covering a small number of very poor people, it covered in the era before the Affordable Care Act, a much larger number of low income and working class people. In order to do that though, he didn't increase the amount of money available. He was unable to do so. Instead, he spread the money more thinly. And the result was that a committee made a list of the different things that doctors could do of which it turns out there are 692, or actually 694, because dialysis is covered by the federal government and childhood vaccination is paid for separately, and then prioritize them, those that were most cost effective and those that were least cost effective. Um, probably the most, and then there was a cutoff, and I believe the first 400 and something items were covered. And those were things like well baby visits and smoking cessation and treatment for mental illness did very well. And things that did very badly were things that were very expensive, high organ transplant with low cure rates. My favorite item, by the way, is if you cut your finger off here by accident, they would reattach it. But if you cut your finger off here at the first knuckle, you were out of luck. So this was a very precise system. The most controversial feature was that if you had a less than 5% chance of living five years with cancer, you did not receive therapeutic chemotherapy. You only received palliative chemotherapy or palliative radiation, comfort care in essence. The estimate was this would save many thousands of lives, but the people whose lives saved were people who didn't realize their lives were being saved. The people whose lives were being taken were people who were being denied care they were overtly asking for. And in a powerfully disturbing optical moment, a woman with terminal lung cancer in Oregon received a letter from the state telling her they would not pay for care for her terminal lung cancer, but they would pay for her assisted suicide which needless to say, did not go over well with the public. The challenge is the cutoff we estimate is probably a lot higher than 5%. It might be in the 15% range, even in the 18% range, where if we didn't spend money on patients who were going to die within five years of cancer and spent the money elsewhere in the healthcare system, we would save more lives. And yet, no doctor I know feels comfortable telling a patient who has an 18% chance of living five years of cancer, we're not gonna pay for your treatment. So people who in theory believe in rational allocation in practice often don't really want to allocate health care rationally. Now let's shift a bit to crisis times. What do we do in terms of allocating resources during a crisis? So the first major modern crisis that required rationing was that for iron lungs during the polio epidemic. My mother had polio during one of the last waves in the early 1950s. And the way they allocated iron lungs was largely on a first come first serve basis. Um, there was actually a way to triage people and put them in a homemade wooden lung until an iron lung became available um, using a vacuum cleaner and four plywood boards. If you have some time to kill on YouTube, you can learn how to design one. Design one. Um, however, the way it works would help you with polio, probably would not help you with COVID. So don't try this at home as a prophylactic measure. First come, first served worked because there were large numbers of people in the exact same situation, and there was really no other effective way to triage them. Um, a more complex system arose for the allocation of dialysis machines in the early 1960s. 
And the famous example occurred at Swedish Hospital in Seattle. A committee of community leaders was appointed to decide how to provide very scarce spacing of dialysis machines. They became known as the God Committee, and that is their photograph, and they consisted of local leaders, some medical, some, some non-medical. Um, they had no sense of the allocation system they used was controversial, so much so that Life Magazine came and profiled them and sat in on the meeting, and you can actually read the transcripts online. Um, the criteria they used was not first come, first serve. Up to a point, it was your physical health, but they had very few slots, so even after they limited people who had other conditions, people who were too old, and I have to say too old for them was 45, so I would have not gotten dialysis, and too young was 18. Um, they still had not enough space. So they used social worth. People applied like they applied for college. And here is a transcript of one of their hearings. So the housewife said, if we are still looking for men with the highest potential of service to society, then I think we must consider that the chemist and the accountant have the finest educational backgrounds of all five candidates. And the lawyer responded, both these men have made provisions so their deaths will not force their families to become a burden on society. And the state official, but that would seem to be placing a penalty on the very people who have perhaps been most provident. And the surgeon, how do the rest of you feel about number three, the small businessman with three children? I'm impressed that his doctor took special pains to mention that this man is an active church work. This is an indication to me of character and moral strength. And the lawyer, it would also help him endure a lingering death. And a minister? Perhaps one man is more active in church work than another because he belongs to a more active church. And then the labor leader. For the children's sake, we've got to reckon with the surviving parent's opportunity to remarry. And a woman with three children has a better chance to find a new husband than a very young widow with six children. This should disturb all of you. I imagine it disturbs most of you. Uh, but it gives you a sense of why we no longer use social worth as a determinant in allocation in any circumstance. There was a large scale public furor response to this. Um, and now we only use medical criteria, which matters in the COVID context. And finally, before COVID, there was a question of what to do with ventilators during a flu pandemic. And this became a controversial issue in New York State because there are two sets for pools of ventilators in any community. There are ventilators in hospitals that are used for acute care. Patients will be on them for three days, three weeks, a month, and then weaned off them. And then there are ventilators for patients with spinal fractures who will never regain, or spinal cord injuries, who will never regain the ability to breathe on their own, who often live in nursing homes or skilled care facilities, but sometimes on their own. And the question New York State had to address was in a pandemic that threatened thousands of lives, whether we would view those as one pool or two pools, meaning whether we would cannibalize ventilators from nursing homes, take patients off them who are severely disabled or um, even sometimes not lucid or not communicative to save dozens of lives of people who be placed in a ventilator for a short period of time. New York decided they were not going to do that. Um, but that is the beginning of the question, not the end of the question. Um, I will get to why that's a more complex question in a moment, but I want to ask you first some basic questions to think about. First, how much risk should we ask healthcare workers to endure in the COVID context? So during the COVID-19 pandemic, a 46-year-old psychiatrist at a New York City hospital was asked to redeploy to work as a general medical provider in an ICU for coronavirus patients. As there's a shortage of PPE, he's given a single surgical mask and a pair of gloves each morning and told to make Mount Sinai proud. Assuming there are patients desperately needing such care, would it be ethical for him to refuse? And this is a challenge many of my colleagues face in one form or another um, throughout the city. I do not need to pick on Mount Sinai. Uh, Obviously, you could say yes, you could say no. Um, as my mother says, psychiatrists are expendable, so it doesn't really matter. Um, but what if that psychiatrist is 60 years old? Or what if he suffers from an underlying medical condition like diabetes? What if they don't have surgical masks, but they do a Batman mask, as you know, the ones that cover your eyes, but not your mouth, and the hospital tells you to be a superhero? Um, does it matter if you live with your elderly grandparents or your six obnoxious children, or alone with your two, two dozen cats? This is not autobiographical, I want to emphasize. Um, and more importantly, does it matter that you didn't sign up for this when you entered medical school? I like to emphasize here that doctors are a guild. They are not a market. So in many fields, if you want to become a barber, all you have to do is show that you're good at barbering and pay the fee to the state to get a barber's license having an apprentice. There's an unlimited number of barbers, limited only by the amount of hair out there. And the same, in essence, is true for lawyers, for business people. 
the state and the government artificially set the number of doctors low to keep reimbursement for doctors relatively high and possibly to keep quality high. So in essence, doctors are much more like taxi medallions or liquor licenses. They are fixed in number, and that may require an extra obligation. So back to our spinal fracture case. So it's easy to say, or relatively easy to say, that if patients are already on ventilators in long-term care facilities, you're not going to take them off those ventilators and, in essence, kill them to use the ventilators elsewhere. But what do you do with patients who come in and need a ventilator for a spinal fracture? You're at the height of a pandemic of COVID, and you have numerous sick people who will need ventilators for a short period of time. And then you have a patient who shows up at the hospital after a motorcycle accident with a C3, C4 spinal fracture, which would require them to have a ventilator for life and, in essence, take that ventilator out of the pool. In times other than a pandemic, that's an easy question. Of course, we would give them the ventilator. Whether we do so now is a much more challenging question. Similarly, should we offer life-saving or life-prolonging transplants during a pandemic? It's worth noting that the average liver transplant patient spends 11 days on a ventilator post-surgery. Do you want to take a ventilator out of the pool for 11 days, uh, which will cost someone else their life? Do you want to take a ventilator out of the pool for an immunocompromised patient who may be even at higher risk of COVID? On the other hand, do you not want to steward that organ that someone has been waiting for for a long time? Third, you have to ask yourself how we allocate resources between COVID care and non COVID care on a broader diagnostic level or surveillance level. So at a number of hospitals in New York City at the height of COVID, clinics from other fields were converted into COVID care and the doctors redeployed to providing acute care for respiratory patients. So if you have an ophthalmology clinic that does screening eye exams for high-risk patients, some of whom will go blind if they're not screened regularly, how do you balance the risk of blindness in some patients against prolonging life in other patients, which is a question we have to answer. So there are a couple of guidelines that have been established that are worth thinking about. Um, and this is in the context of the assumption that ventilators will prove useful in COVID care. There were early studies that showed they actually might not be that, that useful. Um, so at a major study at LIJ early on in the pandemic, 88% of vented patients died, five additional percent never got off the vent. Um, the numbers are better than that, but your prognosis if you end up in an ICU and a ventilator is still not great. Um, it is still fairly grim and some estimates are up to 50% of those patients don't get off the vent. Um, but assuming ventilators have the value we think we do, what system should we use to prioritize them? So there are a couple of different systems we could use, and then I wanna point out what I see as the major problem with them. So one possibility is we can use short-term prognosis. What is your likelihood of getting off the ventilator and surviving this particular interest, this particular incident? The second question we could use is what is your overall life expectancy? So if you have a strong prognosis for recovering from this particular pandemic, but you have other underlying conditions that make your prognosis grim in the long run, how do we weigh those two? Closely related to that, um, and a model that was proposed by Professor White and others, um, takes into account your stage of life and says everybody should have an equal opportunity to pass through every stage of life, and therefore priority should be given to children, young people who have many more stages of life ahead of them. There was a backlash, of course. Elderly patients said, my life is worth just as much as a young patient's is, and we are at an impasse, in essence, in that debate. There's also been considerable debate about one's value during the pandemic, and the two areas this comes up, thinking back to my debate about social worth, by the way, are one, healthcare workers. Um, should we give healthcare workers prioritization for ventilators? If one, they're more likely to return to the workforce, so we'll be able to help more people, which is possible, but less likely in the short term. And two, if it creates an incentive to keep healthcare workers in the workforce, so they take risks to provide COVID care for others. And secondly, and I wrote this lecture before yesterday, before the president was diagnosed with COVID. This is meant very much to be an apolitical comment. Um, but at the height of the COVID, first wave of COVID in, the, in March and April, there was a debate in a number of states, particularly Virginia, over whether political leaders who might be needed to steer resources, to manage the public, to provide reassurance during the pandemic should be given priority for certain interventions. One of the most notable of these is ECMO, um, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, which was, is a salvage remedy after ventilation fails and was thought to be helpful in COVID. And they're unlike ventilators, which most hospitals have dozens or even hundreds of, most major medical care centers only have a handful of machines. 
should these machines either be given to high profile political figures or even held in reserve for them. This became an issue in Great Britain. Boris Johnson was taken to one of the handful of medical centers in Great Britain that does have ECMO available and the media made note of this when he was cared for. What role should pregnant women have in the process? Do they count as one person or two people? Um, was a heated debate in a number of protocols. And now the concern that I have, um, much of my interest is in equity in healthcare. And many of you are probably aware that for what we assume to be non-biological reasons, for sociological reasons, for it to um, social determinants of health, low-income communities, African-American communities, Latinx communities have higher rates of COVID and higher rates of hospitalization and severe COVID. They also, as a result, have a poor prognosis more than well-off and Caucasian populations do. So the question that arises is, should we use these particular allocation systems that penalize people for having underlying conditions that are a result of existing healthcare inequalities? In other words, you get what the game show used to call a double whammy. We give you substandard healthcare for your entire life. So your diabetes becomes brittle or you live in a food desert and therefore you gain weight and therefore have high blood pressure. And then we use a criteria during a crisis time that says, because you have these underlying conditions that society has set up for you, we're less likely to save your life as your prognosis is poor. That is a, a deep problem in any allocation system, but the solution for it is also very challenging. Um, whatever one's political views, my guess is it is easier to grapple with the benefits, not endorsing it, but the benefits of a holistic review or affirmative action system in a setting like employment or a setting like education than it is in a setting like ventilator allocation. A system that says, because you've been treated in a certain way by society, we want to give you a leg up to treat you equally in education, many people find palatable. A system that says the same thing when it's a one-to-one -one trade off in ventilators or ECMO machines, I can tell you from experience in the hospital, a lot of my colleagues find much more unsettling. And there's no easy answer to that, but it's something we're thinking about. And I want to just emphasize briefly that you will see that COVID and COVID severity correlate very deeply with entrenched lines of race and economics that date back at least 90 years in the United States. So these are the red line neighborhoods where African-Americans had a hard time buying homes, um, or the red line neighborhoods and the green ones are the ones where African-Americans were largely shut out um, in the 1930s. And you see this applies to school segregation in New York City today, um, income and life expectancy today, where bank branches are located today, where COVID cases occur today. It's one long continuum. So the neighborhood you will see in dark blue are neighborhoods with um, high percentages of African-American and Hispanic populations. And they're also the neighborhoods with the highest rates of COVID in New York City for the most part. Here you get the same map with the COVID case. I mention all this because you would think the population decline in these neighborhoods would have been the highest in New York City, but it wasn't. Which neighborhoods lost the most population? The exact opposite neighborhoods. Why? because all of the well-off individuals left the city. 420,000 upper middle class and wealthy New Yorkers left the city for various high-end locales. Many of them have not returned. I will mention briefly one other crisis that occurred in the context of COVID. How do we handle withdrawing patients for ventilators? In normal times, if you're on a ventilator and your prognosis is poor, and we have an unlimited number of ventilators, we let you decide when you want to come off. On the other hand, if we know that your prognosis is terminal, but you're gonna linger on that ventilator for weeks or months and not recover, and we have patients who could survive with that ventilator, is there a mechanism for removing you? And currently there isn't. I mention that because having a mechanism for removal over the family or patient's wishes actually might save more lives, including that patients, because doctors may be less willing to place a patient like that on a ventilator at the outset, knowing that they're not gonna be able to remove them. Related to that was the issue of whether or not, and to what degree, patients in the field at the height of COVID should be brought to the hospital. And New York City adopted a rule that if EMS could not get a pulse in the field, they would not bring patients to a hospital. Um, they reversed the policy imposed for a brief period during COVID that said that people who were arrested in the field shouldn't be revived. And there were also proposals there should be UN universal DNR orders for all patients with COVID, but those did not gain much traction. I will finally mention, and then I will take some questions, I think, that I've spoken for my half hour, that I think the most significant challenge we currently face is a lack of uniformity in the rules. So in 2009, 
the federal government urged states to develop crisis standards. Um, and the National Academy of Medicine has offered guidelines for how to do so. As of April, only 26 states have any publicly available crisis guidelines. Why does this matter? It matters because not only do you need guidelines, but you want guidelines that are roughly similar so that states can exchange resources. We currently have a system where the guidelines that are available vary widely from state to state. And this leads to two problems. One, it means that well-heeled patients can go to other states, possibly even spreading COVID with them, to get the care they need. But more important, it means that states won't share their resources with other states with different standards. How does this apply practically? In New York State, at the height of a COVID crisis, we will still give ventilators for patients on dialysis. Kansas will not. It doesn't matter. I'm not taking a stance on whether this is the right approach or the wrong approach, whether New York is right or Kansas is right. What I can tell you is that if I ran the public health system in Kansas and New York State had a higher caseload than we did and asked me for ventilators, I wouldn't supply them because I would know that they would get ventilators that they would not return for patients from New York who are much sicker than the patients in Kansas who might need them. And that's currently the impasse we stand at. I will finally offer one broader thought on COVID and healthcare, um, which is that after the 9-11 attacks, the 9-11 Commission described 9-11 as in part a failure of imagination, meaning a failure of American policymakers to think about the next things that could occur that would threaten American security and American welfare. Peggy Newman in the New York Times and in the Wall Street Journal a few months ago described COVID in the same way as a failure of imagination of Americans to really, and policymakers to really grapple with the risks of a pandemic. I think what is really important now going forward is that we start imagining really hard the other things in healthcare and beyond healthcare that pose similar levels of threats. I will offer you just one concrete example to show you how I think we need to be thinking about the world. So many experts have estimated that a geomagnetic storm, spaced weather, um, could kill tens of millions of Americans and knock out the grid for a period of months. And there are mechanisms to prevent this. It is something that Congress does not discuss, that there have been minimal hearings on. It is something that a few very basic measures now could save thousands or millions of lives in the future. And if you doubt me, the last time a major space weather event occurred was 1859, and it knocked out the American telegraph system and set telegraph wires on fire. So this will not make you sleep well tonight, but food for thought. I guess I should probably stop now. I've spoken for half an hour. Um, I can speak more if people don't have questions, but I'll be glad to take some questions. Jacob, we don't have questions on, on the YouTube chat, uh, but, but and this is shifting over a little bit from what you've just been talking about, um, which has, has been really interesting. And thank you for that, especially those the maps um, in, of uh, essentially systemic racism in, in New York and how that's informed um, COVID, COVID treatment and, and so forth. Um, but because, you know, because this is a, um, literary festival, I would be utterly remiss if I didn't ask you about, about your writing work um, and maybe even how some of these, um, you know, questions about, um, you know, allocation of resources and, and the ethics questions that you face, how those inform your writing. Sure. So I, I will tell you another joke because I think it's topical, um, but it's a very short joke. So a, a rabbi uh, goes and plays golf on the highest of holy holidays, Yom Kippur in the Jewish faith. And he scores a hole in one in every hole. And the angels say to God, why are you rewarding him for, for sinning in this way and letting him score a perfect hole in every hole? And God says, yes, but who can he tell? And that is sort of my experience in the hospital. I hear the most amazing stories every day as a psychiatrist and as an ethicist, and I can't share them with anyone. And it forces me to be more imaginative in how I grapple with these issues. So I do grapple with complex issues, but I try to do it in a much more metaphorical way. Um, I think a couple of the more well-known stories I've written that sort of grapple with this are, um, without taking a position one way or the other on the question of reproductive rights and abortion, um, I have written a story that has gotten some traction about an alien from an unknown planet who was sent to the United States in disguise as a Latvian restaurateur. And he opens up his restaurant and then discovers there's an abortion clinic next door. And has to, and there's a protest against it, and has to grapple with this as someone who knows nothing about the American debates over this issue. Um, I've grappled with 
animal rights in the context of a couple who, to decide whether or not they want to, want to have a baby, first adopt a hedgehog. And then the hedgehog becomes depressed, and the resources they would spend on the baby have to be spent on providing psychiatric care for the hedgehog. So I do it in a very metaphorical way. But I'd like to think I'm asking the same questions. Thank you. Um, is there anything that you have just, just short that you might be able to read for us? Um, that is, if you give me one second, I can walk across the room and get something. Since it's topical, I will read the opening few lines of a hedgehog story because that seems a popular piece. It is called La Tristesse des Hérissons, which I am told, though my French is abysmal, is the sadness of hedgehogs. We've been living together for eight months when we adopted the hedgehog. I'd wanted a German shepherd or a Doberman pincher, a fearless, intimidating animal that could accompany me jogging in the park late at night. Adeline wanted a baby. Neither of us had ever mentioned anything about hedgehogs, but then Adeline read an article on unconventional pets, a throwaway piece in the back of a complimentary airline magazine. And soon enough, I found myself wheeling a four foot long glass tank into the service elevator on a dolly. Hedgehogs require their space. It turned out they also prefer warm, arid climates. So Adeline demanded that we install a convective heater and dehumidifier in the living room. Outside, it was a balmy May in Manhattan. Inside, our apartment sweltered like the Kalahari. Adeline named the hedgehog Orion. For three days, the prickly little devil entertained us by devouring mealworms and burrowing under aspen chips and exploring a makeshift maze that Adeline fashioned from cereal boxes. According to the Happy Hedgehog Handbook, responsible owners challenged their hogs with intellectual puzzles five times daily. My girlfriend followed the guide's countless do's and don'ts with a fundamentalist zeal. Though I wasn't as smitten with the creatures myself, I was delighted to see Adeline in such bright spirits for the first time since her mother's stroke. We didn't argue all weekend and our sex life rekindled, though Adeline constantly reminded me to keep our volume at a minimum, fearful that an errant moan might alarm our barbed roommate. Actually, the word she used wasn't alarm. It was traumatized. I could envision her writing me up just as she does the prospective parents she interviews during her home visits for the adoption agency. Un domicile unsuitable for placement, poor boundary maintenance, hedgehog likely to be exposed to sounds of sexual intercourse and emotionally traumatized. So I screwed like a deaf mute. Sunday was my late night at the restaurant. I co-own a bistro and wine bar with two of my former law school classmates, blood brothers in the fraternal order of ex-attorneys, and we take turns closing out the register. That evening, I returned home to find Adeline kneeling opposite Orion's cage, guarding the sleeping hedgehog with the intensity of a pediatric nurse. The ambient heat made even minor tasks like removing my raincoat feel like hard labor. I kissed the top of Adeline's head. You're up late. Can I ask you something, she asked. Her voice carried an ominous tone, the same tone she'd used months earlier when accusing me of having an affair. What's wrong, I asked. Do you think he's depressed? It took me a moment to realize she meant the hedgehog. What does he have to be depressed about? I poured myself a shot of warm bourbon from the decanter on the sideboard. You got it darn good if you ask me. No hawks or jackals to hide from, an endless supply of mealworms and crickets. The varmint has pretty much hit the hedgehog jackpot. I think he's depressed, said Adeline. He looks depressed. I did my connubial duty, placing my face inches from the glass cage and examining the hedgehog at eye level. As far as I could tell, Orion looked no different than he had the previous afternoon. Languid, dopey, and content. How could a creature be depressed when his brain was only the size of a kumquat? I'm really worried, said Adeline. Mental illness is all too common in hedgehogs. I read an article online this morning. I tapped the glass. Orion cocked his snout. We should take him back and get another one, I proposed. I regretted the words as soon as he left my mouth. What is wrong with you, snapped Adeline? If you had a sick baby, you wouldn't take him back and get another one. Good thing we have a hedgehog, I thought, and not a baby, but I had a sense to keep the sentiment to myself. I'll stop there. Thank you. 
gives you a sense of the kind of writing I do at least. Mm -hmm. I will add, by the way, if people in the audience um, are interested, and this is for people on YouTube and people who see in the future, are interested in reading that story in entirety, if they email me, I'll be glad to send them a free PDF of the entire collection. That's, that's really good to hear. We can, uh, if, if people email us too, if they if they can't find your uh, email address, we, we can certainly share that with them. That'd be great. All right, so um, I suppose we'll we'll wrap up this session. Thank you so much for the, the generosity of your being here and for everything that you've given us uh, this morning. We really appreciate your contribution to the festival.